Well, Billy Graham, back in the 1950s, uh, was leading some of his evangelistic gatherings in London, and at that time, he got a call uh, from the office of Winston Churchill, asking if he would come and meet with the Prime Minister. And so he did, and he showed up, and upon entering was told, you have exactly 20 minutes with the Prime Minister, no longer, because then he has lunch with the Duke of Windsor. And so Billy Graham entered into the room and saw... Churchill standing there alone, and the first thing Churchill did was congratulate him on the success of his gatherings. He had been packing out stadiums night after night in the heart of London. And uh, he said, congratulations on your success. And Billy Graham said, well, it's not mine, it's God's doing. And Churchill said, okay. Uh, he said, but I don't know if I got Marilyn Monroe and myself over to Wembley Stadium, we could pack them the way you have. And he said, how are you doing it? Why do people gather to hear you? And Billy Graham said, I think what they want is the word of God. He said, they used to hear it preached faithfully here every week, but it's been a while. And Churchill said, times have changed, haven't they? And then he looked down at his desk and they were covered with newspapers and he said, look at these headlines. There is war, there is robbery, there is murder, there is violence. And as he began to look at all this and began to explain it to Billy Graham, Billy said, these are dark times. And then he noted in his autobiography that he heard Churchill use the words hopelessness nine times. And then finally, in a moment of honesty, Churchill looked up at Billy Graham and said, I am a man without hope in this world. Do you have any hope? Now, let me ask you a question. If it was you standing there and Winston Churchill asked you, do you have hope, what would you say? What would you offer him? Uh, let me say this. You may not have to answer that question for Churchill, but we got to answer it for somebody because hopelessness is on the rise in the world today. Uh, the CDC has a report drawn from nationwide surveys of high school students, and that survey showed that among 9th to 12th graders nationwide, the number indicating they have persistent feelings of hopelessness has risen. In 2009, it was 26%. One out of four high school students said, I feel persistent sense of hopelessness. In 2021, it was 44%. Massive increase. And lest you think we're exempt from that, uh, a new study of young adults under the age of 35, the General Social Survey, has found that unhappiness is at record levels among Americans. And for those under the age of 35, since they have studied your happiness since the 1970s, only 16% of people under 35 said they're unhappy. Now it's over 30%. And it's particularly high among those with no spiritual anchor. Uh, a sense of hopelessness is pervasive in this day. And people need hope. And yet it's interesting in this passage, Peter's been writing to a persecuted minority of believers in Jesus in the midst of a hostile context. And he tells them in this text, I just want you to be ready. When people start asking you about your hope, be ready to explain it. And so we're looking at some, uh, some of the most enigmatic and confusing verses in the whole New Testament today, and we're looking at one of the most popular, and the most popular one is that verse 15. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have within you. But under that is some assumptions that you have hope, that you have a confident expectation of good in the future, and that that hope has so manifested in your life that people ask you about it. You can't see hope, but they're gonna see something in your life that looks so different, people that were hostile become curious and say, explain to me why your behavior is like it is, so different from ours, it must rise up from a hope. Explain that hope. And then the next assumption is, can you explain it? Do you have a hope? Is it manifest in your life? And do you have the ability to explain it? So in a world that needs hope, we need to figure out how to have it, how to display it, how to explain it, so we can be dealers of hope in the world. And let me just say this. Uh, this is one of those sermons that's really for believers in Jesus. So if you're not one of those, we're so glad you're here. You're just kind of sitting in and hearing how we talk to each other. And hopefully it'll explain some of your strange friends, and hopefully it'll encourage you to join us on this wild adventure. But what Peter's going to give us is some perspective, and then he's going to give us some practice. And then he's going to give us a proof of con concept. Does this even work? And the perspective he gives us is, again, odd. This is an odd text. But the perspective he gives us comes in verse 13 and 14. 
Now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. What's the perspective that makes you a hopeful person even in the midst of hostility? The perspective, he says, is you're blessed when you suffer, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. If you're suffering, you're blessed. What? No, if I'm suffering, feels like the opposite of blessed. Uh, If I'm suffering, if people are cruel to me, if I'm losing opportunities, if I'm facing difficulty in life, that doesn't feel like blessing. It feels like cursing. It feels like God forgot about me or it feels like God doesn't care or it feels like I did something wrong or it feels like God's mad. Like, it doesn't feel like blessing. What are you talking about, Peter? He's writing to people who are suffering in this context with a wide variety of pressures and he says to them, hey, that suffering you're experiencing, it's blessing. That is not the default human setting. Neither was it Peter's. It's interesting, Peter was the guy that when Jesus said to his disciples, I am going to suffer, Peter was like, whoa, whoa, what? No, no, no. There shouldn't be suffering in this crowd. And yet now here he understands there is purpose for suffering. And he says here, if you suffer, you're blessed. That's a different perspective. That's not normal. What's he talking about? Well, before we move on this point, let's talk about the definitions of three things. What's the good they were doing What's the suffering they were experiencing? And what kind of blessing are we talking about here? Well, you get like a new car or get your tuition paid for? Like, what are we dealing with? (laughs) What's the good they were doing? Well, notice the parallels. Who would harm you if you're zealous for doing good should you suffer for righteousness sake. That righteousness is being right before God. And all through the book, he's been talking about that, that when you put your faith in Jesus, you are transformed from the inside out, that God changes your heart and it changes your life that you've been purified for a sincere brotherly love, so love one another earnestly. That's what he said earlier, that your God is a God of love who came for you with his mercy and his grace and brought you into his family. That's what he did. He purified you for a pure and sincere brotherly love, so therefore love. You have a loving God, love people. Be tenderhearted, compassionate. And then he says, your God is holy, so you be holy in all your conduct. You abstain from the passions of your flesh which waged war against your soul. He says, when you come to a holy and loving God, by his grace born again into his family, you become a holy and loving person. You start doing things you didn't used to do, caring for others, and you stop doing some things you used to do and that your friends still do. You begin to change. And he says, as you do that, you will suffer. There will be people who harm you. What's the suffering? Well, even in this passage later, he says it. You'll be slandered. You'll be reviled. You'll be insulted. As your life begins to change because of your new commitment to this religion, there'll be people who misunderstand you and malign you. Why is that? Well, I'll give you a little preview of text in the future. I don't want to give away too much, but he'll say in 1 Peter 4, the time is past for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. He says, a heads up, your your friends that don't have your same commitment to Jesus are probably not going to insult or revile or malign you for the good that you're doing. It's the things you abstain from doing that will get you in trouble. That if you look in society, it's when the Christian says, I can't do that. People say, what are you judging me? And and your abstinence brings forth some hostility. Some of you have felt that in your home, your friendship circles, or at your office. And so it's often not what the Christian does, but what the Christian refuses to do that brings being maligned. That's what was happening in Peter's day, and it happens today. That they're being slandered. They're being talked bad about. People are being mean to them. And so he says, if that happens, if you're doing good and you're suffering, you're blessed. Now, what's the blessing here? Well, the word blessing means you're a privileged recipient of divine favor, that God's going to bless you. What, what does that look like? Well, he says later in 414, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now catch that, he just defined blessing. If you're being insulted for Christ, you're blessed. Why? Because the spirit of God will rest on you. That in that moment you're being shocked, uh, uh, that you're being slandered, the spirit of God will be with you. He'll comfort you. He will be near to you. 
And then he said in chapter one, if you remember, he says, you're being grieved with various trials. This is the testing of your genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, the blessing's gonna come how? That when you're slandered, God will be there with you. And then in the end, there is praise and glory and honor for you. That you may suffer now, but God will be with you in the suffering. And there is good in your future. What's the perspective he's giving believers? You, you, can, you can know you're blessed even in the midst of difficulty. How? Because I know there's something bigger than my suffering and there's something beyond my suffering. There is someone bigger than my circumstances and there's something good beyond my circumstances. That's the perspective. If I just see this, I get sad. But if I look up and I see over, then I get hope. Do you see it? That's what the believer does. Which is interesting, before we move on, it's funny with these two verses, there's two different ways to kind of understand the way he's talking. One of them is to look at him and say, he says, um, that if you are, uh, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you'll be blessed. There, there's one way to read that that says, who's there to harm you if you're doing good? Meaning, if you're doing good, who would be mad at you? Who's gonna give you a hard time? No one's gonna give you a hard time. But if perhaps somebody does, don't worry about it because God will bless you. And that's one way to understand it. I, I think that's true. If you do good, people probably won't be mad at you for that. How dare you be honest and generous? But I don't think that works in this text because all through 1 Peter, he's been talking about how people are slandering you and maligning you and attacking you. And so if he says, who's gonna harm you if you're doing good? They're like, I don't know. Let's start with Nero the emperor and half of Asia Minor, like they're gonna look at him and say, Peter, are you serious? But if you look contextually at the verse right before this, he was quoting to them a psalm, and in that psalm he says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ear is attentive to their prayer, but his face is turned against those who do evil. So who is there to harm you for doing good? And that way of understanding it is this, the Lord is with you. He sees you, he hears you, he knows you, and he's turning his face against them. So who can harm you? And the reality is someone, somewhat, for a limited time, but ultimately, no one. Because the guy on my team is bigger than the guys on their team. And so if you suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. Hey, God's on my team. And, and if I just look at my circumstances, this person's mean to me, then when they say something mean, I'm gonna wanna revile them back. When they hurt me, I wanna hurt them back. But if you lift your gaze and see a God, God tips the scales in your favor. And when you put God into the equation, it changes the whole dynamic. And if you go, no, God's with me, God's on my side, hey, then I don't have to worry about you hurting me. I'm okay. I got something bigger than this circumstance. And I got good coming for me beyond these circumstances. So I'm good. The only person who's not good here is you. And the reality is that perspective, I'm blessed. I'm right where God wants me. It changes things. And that's how, you, from that perspective, you can change your practice. That's where he moves. So have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your heart, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. He says, so don't be afraid. When I understand that, I'm not afraid. But I set apart Christ is holy, always being prepared to give it a defense for the hope that I have. Now, it's interesting there, he quotes Isaiah chapter eight. We don't have time to preach all of Isaiah chapter eight. But in Isaiah chapter eight, it was the people of God in the Old Testament. They were being attacked by the much larger nation of Assyria. And they were scared. Assyria's coming after us. They're bigger. They got better equipment. They're more technologically advanced. We are in a hurt locker. And the prophet Isaiah comes to them and says, hey, don't call conspiracy what people call conspiracy. Don't fear what they fear. But the Lord of hosts, literally Yahweh of the angel armies, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and rock of stumbling. It's interesting. It's a passage that Peter quoted earlier, that Jesus Christ is the stone you either stumble over or build your house on. And so here he subs out Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, and he puts in Jesus Christ because they're the same person. And he looks at Jesus and says, hey, you set apart Jesus as holy. Don't fear what people fear. Don't dread what they dread. Fear the Lord, dread him, and he becomes a sanctuary. Not something that scares you, but something that comforts you because you know I'm resting on him. 
So when you got that perspective, suffering is blessing, hey, honoring Christ fuels that hope. He's got me, I'm good. And so I don't need to be afraid. The Lord of angel armies is on my side. Uh, There's a cool moment in Chronicles of Narnia. I don't know if you read that. Chronicles of Narnia. How do they picture the Jesus Christ character? As a lion, Aslan. There was a little boy who wrote a letter uh, to C.S. Lewis once, confessing to him, I find Jesus boring, but I like Aslan better. And C.S. Lewis said, everything you love about Aslan is Jesus. And there's a moment in Horse and His Boy where Shasta had been enslaved by a man who's stronger than him, had managed to escape, but is fleeing for his life, has armies surrounding him that are trying to find him. There is no escape and you are completely powerless. You're a little boy in the world of men who have swords and weapons and armies, and you have nothing. You're a little boy that finally in a moment is abandoned walking to the woods in the middle of the night. And as he comes to terms with his helplessness and hopelessness, he begins to cry, and then he hears a heavy breathing beside him in the darkness. And as he hears it, he says, there's something next to me, and he finally speaks to the something. And as he begins to speak to it, he hears a deep and rumbling, terrifying voice. And he asks him who he is. And he says, I am the lion who is chasing you. And in that moment, he realizes, I am with the terror of nations, the terror of men. I am with a lion. And yet that lion is not cruel to him. That lion leads him. That lion says, I'm here to guide you. And what happens? This little boy sets his face on the lion, this terrible, trembling, beautiful thing, and he just fixes his eyes on him, and he walks. And as the day dawns, the lion disappears, but he looks, and he has exited all the land he feared, walked right past the armies he dreaded, and he is on into the land of hope, into Narnia. How did that happen? How could he walk through and past all his fear? Because he had a bigger fear. How can you walk and not tremble when people make fun of you, when people are mad at you? Some of us were so afraid of being maligned on Twitter, of someone criticizing us at work, at someone saying something nasty to us on Instagram. We're so scared of of what it may cost us to say what we really think in the public square. How do you stop being so afraid? You get a bigger fear. And when you fear the Lord, he doesn't become a dread, he becomes a sanctuary. And when I fear him, I do not need to fear anything else. And see, that's what's interesting. That's where the hope comes from. What's the hope come from? I got good coming for me in the future. Why? Because I got a God above me right now, and he likes me. This lion leads me. That's the beautiful presentation of Jesus Christ. Imagine a lion bearing down on you. Imagine the size of those paws. Imagine that massive face Imagine one bearing down on you with those massive teeth that could sink into you and you cannot let go. Imagine its hot breath in your face and then imagine it licking you. That's the gospel. (laughs) That the Lord of angel armies, the host, Jesus Christ himself, the lion of Judah comes to you with all that power and brings grace. And you go, the God of the universe likes me. The Lord of angel armies hears me and sees me. So you're making fun of me on Twitter? Okay, I'm not in trouble. You're in trouble. Because the guy on my team's bigger than your team. And that will lead you to be gentle and respectful, even to your enemies. This is beautifully pictured in uh, Captain Phillips, the movie starring Tom Hanks. It's the story, if you remember, of... uh, an American cargo ship being captured by pirates. And Tom Hanks is Captain Phillips, and you remember in that scene, these pirates from Somalia take over the ship, and one of them puts a gun in his face and says, I'm the captain now. You used to be in charge, you're not. I'm the captain now, and I've got you under the gun. And so they're in that moment of threat. I have no resources, I feel small. Someone's attacking me, persecuting me, hurting me. I'm scared, and then suddenly, the United States military shows up on the scene. And in the movie, you see this American warship pull up and Navy SEALs line up on the deck and they're snipers. 
And you see the shadows of these highly trained men begin to set up and train their sights on what is now just a little life raft as this Somali pirate and Captain Phillips are being loaded onto this little boat. Suddenly they realize the United States military and the Navy SEALs are at my back. And you see a change in Captain Phillips. He realizes, I'm not the one under the gun. You're the one under the gun. I'm not the one who's in trouble. Now you're the one that's in trouble. Yes, you've got a gun to my face, but I've got the U.S. Army and the military and Navy and Navy SEALs at my back. And yet in that moment, you see, he doesn't get arrogant. He doesn't look at this pirate and go, you see who's coming for me? You see who's theirs on the deck? Navy frickin' SEALs. You got that? <laughs> S for C, and we're on the C. A for air, you can't escape there. L for land. Like he doesn't start <laughs> mocking this guy. What happens? He gets humble. He says while he's bound, while he's captive, while a gun's on him, hey man, I'm not in trouble right now, you're in trouble. Hey man, I'm not under the gun, you're under the gun. Hey man, you confess and forsake and you'll find mercy. You surrender and they'll be kind to you. Do not persist in your evil. It will only cost you because the people who are with me are greater than anything you got with you. And that sense of confidence leads to a fearlessness. Do you see it? That's the secret. So back to our original point. How are people going to see hope in you? Hope's invisible. Can't see it. What do they see? They see hope that I believe, confidence that good is in my future. How do you know that? How do they see it? What they see is that you're not afraid. That's what they see. They see somebody who doesn't shake. And they look at you, and as they did with martyrs of old, our earliest brothers and sisters in the faith, we will take your job and take it. We will plunder your property. Okay. We will take your life. I accept that too. Why are you not scared now? We're throwing at you everything that scares us, and you're not scared. Give me a reason for the hope that you have in you. And the answer is, because he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Because there's something above my suffering, and there's something beyond my suffering. This perspective of Peter's does not make sense if there is no God, okay? So if you don't think there's a God, this is not great advice. But if there is a God, and he really runs all this, then I know that the one with me is greater than what you got. So I don't need to be afraid of you. Actually, I can be gentle with you and respectful with you. The Christian does not retaliate against the person who mocks us. We respectfully respond because we know we're not in trouble. They are. That's what Stephen did as he was martyred in the book of Acts. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He prays for his enemies while they're killing him because that's what he saw Jesus do on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That Jesus entrusted his soul to him who judges justly. And that changes things. John Patton's autobiography is one of my favorite books. John Patton was a missionary to the New Hebrides, to a tribe that practiced cannibalism. And uh, the sacrifice of wives. When a man would die, they would break the wife's neck and throw her body onto his grave so she could serve him in the afterlife. And when John Patton saw this, that they would routinely beat their wives and murder them as their husbands died, uh, he said, this has to stop. These women are made in the image of God. They deserve respect. And in one moment, he watched these men who had already murdered three women were beating a woman and he stepped forward and says, this stops now. And he was there alone. And as the tribe surrounded him, a man picked up a club to kill him and John Patton did not move. And frankly, that freaked them out. <laughs> they were like, we're all here. We're gonna kill you, eat you. You know the drill. I mean, we've been doing this. Why aren't you scared? And it was his lack of fear that put a fear into them. And they asked him to explain the hope that he had. And he did with gentleness and respect. And they said, now we will not kill you. We will kill all your enemies. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm looking for. But it opened the door for him to explain the gospel because they saw someone who's not scared. I had a friend 
uh, that came to Christ and he uh, owned a salon. He would cut hair. And I was asking him how he came to Christ. And he said, uh, my salvation came through a scalp. I don't know what that means. And he said, there was a lady that would always come in and I would work on her hair and she always had dry scalp and dandruff. We'd always talk about different shampoos and different things she could do to sort of help with her dry scalp. And he said, one day she came in and her scalp looked healthier. And he said, have you been using all these shampoos? And he's like, not really. And he's like, weird, okay. And he said, then as time went by, her scalp looked healthier and healthier. Her hair was growing in fuller. And finally he looked and he said, your body is changed. What is going on? And she said, I became a Christian. I put my faith in Jesus. And he's like, whatever. But he said, over time, I saw her salvation working out through her scalp. I saw that the Prince of Peace had really made her peaceful. And so finally, as he looked at his life, and it was a wreck, he went from mocking Jesus to asking her questions about Jesus. His hostility became curiosity. And that's what Peter's advocating right here. Do you have hope that there's a God above your pain now and he has promised good to you in the future? Has that hope manifested in a changed life? Do people see you at peace or are you just as scared as your lost neighbors? If you're just as scared, there's nothing special about you. Right? What's the secret? If you go, well, Ben, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be stressed. What do you do? Honor Jesus Christ as holy. That's what he said. You fix your eyes on the lion. And when you look at Jesus, the more you set your eyes on him, the less scared you'll be of them. And the less scared you are of them, the greater hope you will give them that they could know the Jesus that has so settled you. This is the important task of the believer, that they see us trust Jesus. And when they see us really believe it, they will want what we have. That's why in verse 17, it says, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Why is it better for suffering for doing good than evil? Well, if you're gonna suffer, you might as well suffer for doing something good, right? I mean, that's sort of what he's saying. But notice he said, if it's God's will. Does God will suffering to come into your life? Yes, he just said it. Does God want to hurt you? No. Does God condone sin? No, he condemns it and he will judge it. And yet as God rules over this broken world, will he allow his children to suffer? Yes, he will. Why? Because when your friends see you go through what terrifies them and you're not afraid, they will want to do what you're doing. They will want to know who you know. It says that he will shame them, is what it says here, right? That when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. That, that doesn't mean you just make them feel bad. That's just part A. That they realize making fun of you is silly and ridiculous. Earlier, he said, you will silence the ignorance talk. They will realize, maybe I misunderstood you. But the ultimate goal we looked at a few weeks ago, he says, so that they will glorify God on the day of his visitation. So again, the track here, what do you do? I hope in Jesus. There's something good above me and something good beyond this circumstance. And as I hope in Jesus, I'm not afraid. And as I'm not afraid, they ask about my hope and I give them a reason, Jesus. And they make fun of him. And as they make fun of him and revile him, they see my good deeds and my gentleness and my respect that I'm not mean. And they want to know the God I know. It silences their foolish talk. And they suddenly say, I want to put my hope in that God. So I glorify him on the day of his visitation. We had a girl when I led a college ministry, worked on our resources team. And I remember asking her, so how'd you get on the team? And I thought she was going to say something like, well, when I moved to college, I was looking for a church and I came to your ministry and blah, 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 all that. She was like, well, you know, I was an atheist and loved making fun of Christians. And I'm like, okay, this is about to be good. <laughs> and she said, yeah, it was my favorite pastime to mock you people. And she said, and I was good at it because most of y'all are ignorant of what you believe. And she said, so I was just easy to dunk on. She was like, I was just read a couple books and all these Christians were ignorant. And she said, I, I derived a sweet pleasure from making fun of you and disrupting people's faith. And she said, and then I showed up one day in class and I sat down by this goody two shoes looking girl and she was so nice to me. Well, hi. And I'm like, whatever. And she just kept being nice to me. 
well, how are you doing? I love your shoes today. Oh my gosh, you look great. Hey, I'm having a pancake party at my house. Do you want to come? And she's like, did you just invite me over for pancakes? Like, who are you? I'm not your friend. And she said, but this girl, even when I was rude to her, was so nice. She said, and then I found out she was a Christian. And she's like, my default was mockery. And she said, but it was hard to mock her because she was so gentle and so respectful. And, and the more kind she was, the more she wore down my defenses. So I went to get pancakes. And then they kept inviting me to this Bible study, and I came. And as I sat there, I realized, hey, I was actually a bit ignorant on what you people really believe. And I became interested, if Jesus is real, if God is real, then it would make sense she act that way. Her peace makes sense. Her gentleness makes sense. Her respect makes sense. And she said, so we were driving in the car one day on the home, uh, way home, and I asked him, okay, so what do I gotta do to be baptized? And they just hit the brakes, what? <laughs> and she said, I'm in. And she was silenced, she was shamed, but shame wasn't the goal. It was to open her up to maybe there's a God that I wanna glorify on the day of his visitation. That's how we do it, you see that? So I believe there's suffering beyond the blessing and I honor Christ as holy. And when I honor Christ, it casts out fear. So let me tell you something. If you're like, if, if no one ever asks you about the hope that you have, think about that Christian. He's assuming they're gonna ask you why you're so hopeful. If no one's ever asked you that, oops, you got something to work on. What do you gotta work on? Uh, passing out tracks? sliding into the gospel. Hey, would you like a drink of water? You know, Jesus is the water of life. <laughs> no, please don't do that. Don't do that with a Passion City shirt on. <laughs> what do you got to work on? In your heart, set apart Christ as holy. That's your job. When you set apart Christ as holy, what does that mean? It means you set him apart. I mean, like, just less TV, less social media, less Twitter, less what other people think, less absorption with me, because that's demonstrably led to hopelessness and happilessness. I'm going to set apart Christ and fix my eyes on him. I'm going to watch how he treated the woman in adultery. I'm going to watch how he treated the selfish man who was just chasing money. I'm gonna watch the way he handled his critics and forgave them and prayed for them. I'm gonna watch him and the more I watch him, how strong he was, but how loving he was, how fearless he was and how tender he is. The more I focus on him, the more I'll be like him. And the more I'm like him, the more I'll be less like them. And the more they'll misunderstand me, the more I'll get slandered, I'll get criticized. But their criticism might become curiosity. And if it does, I better be ready to give them a reason for the hope that I have. And the reason is him. So you fix your eyes on Jesus and let him make you like him. Now, all that sounds great, but you go, Ben, is there a proof of concept that this is gonna work? That if I suffer, I'm really blessed? And as I suffer and hope in Jesus, good will come in the world? Is that really gonna work? Well, you see the proof in verse 18. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And I love that he points out, you wanna have an idea that suffering can lead to blessing? Look at Jesus. Jesus suffered on that cross. And just think about that for a moment. The son of God entered suffering for you and for me. It looked like a victory for the bad guys. Pilate wanted to just get rid of a hassle. The leader, religious leadership in Jerusalem wanted to eliminate a threat, and it looked like they did it easily. Let's execute this rabble rouser. It looked like, from a certain perspective, darkness was winning. And yet Peter, when he preached in Acts, said, aligned against Jesus were Pilate and Herod and the leadership to do exactly what God predestined to occur. Peter says, there was real slander 
There was real malice. There was real evil. But there was a God above our circumstance and good beyond our circumstance. That Jesus' suffering was for a purpose. He was taking our unrighteousness and making us righteous. He was taking our alienation so we would become the family of God. He was taking our shame so we could be made pure. He was leading us into the family to bring you and me to God. Does suffering lead to blessing? Exhibit A is the cross, the man we're following. And so you don't need to be afraid. You fix your hope on him and the world will see hope in you and they'll want to know the God who gave it to you. Now, as we close, it gets so weird. And here's the bummer. There's so much going on in this text I wish I could explain to you. I've spent so much time reading this craziness and I don't have time to unpack it all. But he says he was being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, and he's at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. He makes some assumptions there. He's like, you know, it's like, when he proclaimed to the spirits in prison from the days of Noah. And you're like, yeah, wait, what? No, what? When did Jesus proclaim anything to spirits in a prison? What, what's the spirit prison in the days of Noah? What are you talking about? This is one of the most controversial, confusing passages in the entire New Testament. Uh, one commentator said, if you, if you add up all the different ways to interpret this, there's almost 180 different ways. There's really three main ones. Let me tell you briefly. Uh, the first one is, some look at it and say, well, Jesus Christ preached to the evil people in Noah's day through Noah. Because Peter said before, the, the spirit of Christ was in the prophets. So maybe way back in the Old Testament, Christ was inspiring Noah to preach against people who were doing evil. I don't think that makes sense because of the sequencing here. Christ was dead, made alive, then he went and proclaimed. Uh, a second idea is that Jesus Christ died in the flesh, was buried, and while he was in the grave... He, he descended to the lower regions and, and preached the gospel. And then you go, to who? Uh, to give people a second chance or to tell demons there's no hope for them? Uh, there's a set of options. And then he rose from the grave and then he left. But again, I think the sequencing mitigates against that. He died, he was made alive, and then he went. Also, that dichotomy of flesh versus spirit is, is really more platonic uh, than it is scriptural. Because Jesus died fully, and he was raised fully. So he didn't just die in his body and then have a spirit raised. He was raised with a body. That's why he came to the disciples. I have flesh. Does a ghost have flesh? Touch me. Give me some fish. Let me eat it. And so when it says here that he was made alive in the spirit, that doesn't mean his spirit was divorced from his body. What it means is the spirit of God brought him to life. That's what Romans says, that he was resurrected through the power of the Holy Spirit, that he's been given a spiritual body. That's a tangible one and yet spiritual. So what do I think happened? I think option three happened, which is really wild. And that is that in Genesis chapter five and six, before the days of Noah uh, or the flood, you have this enigmatic passage that says in Genesis that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whoever they chose. A lot of disagreement on that. Who are the sons of God that are intermarrying with the daughters of men and producing children of such wickedness that God judges the earth. And people differ on that passage. Is it uh, the godly line that was disobeying God? Is it, is it kings that they're called sons of God and they were intermarrying with women and producing evil kids? Or is it demonic spirits? And I think it's some mix of the last two that there's something demonic and evil happening in Noah's day that was so bad, God says there's only evil in these people's hearts continuously and God judges the earth. You see, in 2 Peter, Peter brings up, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus, committing them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if he didn't spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, along with seven others, when he brought a, upon a flood to the ungodly, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. And in Jude, it says, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So in 2 Peter and in Jude, you have angels that stepped out of their abode, did what they were not meant to do, and God chained them, put them in Tartarus, a pit, to keep them till the day of judgment. Right? 
Now, why does Peter bring this up? This is so bizarre. Well, remember, these people were in Asia Minor. And Asia Minor uh, was traditionally held where the ark landed. Actually, it's the answer to a crazy trivia question that, that under the Roman Empire, so centuries later, there's only one biblical character ever put on a coin, and it's Noah. Because there's a town in Asia Minor, even called the Ark, that people believed Noah's Ark landed there. There were multiple flood stories coming out of Asia Minor that the only biblical prophet people who weren't believers knew about was Noah. He was popular in that area, that everyone knew the story of Noah, that a righteous man surrounded by wicked people in reverent fear trusted God and obeyed him and God rescued him even through a flood. They all knew that story. And so Peter looks at them and says, hey, that story is like you. You are a small group of people surrounded by wickedness, but you set apart God as holy and you serve him in reverent fear. You will be rescued from judgment. And so Jesus Christ is a type of Noah and you and me are a type of Noah. But I think it's beyond just a type. He says, these evil spirits that were terrifying in the days of Noah, which I don't know if you've seen the Noah movie starring Russell Crowe. It's trash. Uh, <laughs> but when he starts talking to like the rock demons, I'm like, and we have literally jumped the shark. I'm just out of here. <laughs> but the best thing the movie does is in the first few minutes, you see how scared Noah is. This is the darkest days in human history. That's how it depicts them because that's how the Bible depicts them. And the people of Asia Minor would have known, if you asked them, what was the most wicked day in human history? They would say, Noah's day. Pervasive evil, looking like it's winning. And yet Noah and just a few people, eight, said, but we believe there's a God above our circumstances. And so we believe there's good beyond our circumstances. And so we're gonna trust God. We're gonna serve him. We're gonna build this ark and everyone's laughing. What a moron. And I'm gonna keep serving God in the midst of a dangerous day. And as I serve him, I'm rescued. I'm vindicated. Judgment is coming, but not for those who flee to God for grace. And here, what I love about this is Peter tells us, not only is Jesus a picture of that, not only are you a picture of that, these demonic forces that so terrified the ancient world, he says at the end, Jesus has risen and is victorious over them. That I think that's the interpretation of what Jesus did. As he rose, he proclaimed to those in powers and authorities, the angels, authorities, and powers, I now rule you. The point is, whatever terrifies you, Jesus wins. There is no force and no power that can overcome him. And so Peter grabs the thing that would terrify that community the most, the evil power surrounding Noah. And he says, yeah, Jesus rules over them too. And as he ascended and rose from the grave, he told them, I win, you lose. Darkness doesn't get the final word. The cross has the final word. And so baptism saves you, not, not the washing of water to cleanse your filth, but a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I trust what he did and I'm with him. And if I'm with him, I may suffer, but there's a God above it and there's good beyond it. So I have hope, I do not fear. And as we hope in a dangerous day, people will do what Winston Churchill did. He looked at Billy Graham and he looked at the newspapers and said, I have no hope in the world. Do you have hope? And Billy said, yes, I do. My hope is in the good news of Jesus Christ, who didn't stand far off from our suffering, but entered it, who became acquainted with our grief. And he who knew no sin became sin for us on the cross that he is intimately acquainted with our sin and shame. He bore it on the cross, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to God. And so I see the darkest day in human history, the murder of Jesus Christ, became the best day, the opening of a door to forever. And so when I'm in the midst of a dark day, I know my God rules over it. 
I know good is beyond it. And as Noah rode through the waters of the flood and came out to a garden, I know I'll ride through this struggle and I'll come out the other side. As Jesus went into the grave and rose triumphantly, I know I will go through this dark valley, but I'll come out the other side. I've got hope because I got a God above and I got good beyond, so I trust. It's been 20 minutes. Duke of Windsor is waiting. And Churchill said, let him wait and told Billy, please continue. And for 15 more minutes, Billy Graham got to tell him about a God who will give hope to you and to me. Do you know him? If you don't, all of our hope is in that man, that he took our sin and made us holy. And so we're not arrogant, we're humble. We're just following the lion. And as we follow him, we got hope and we have confidence. And we want you to know him too. And if you're his, you fix your eyes on Jesus. I'm telling you what, it is so stark in the world today. You wake up in the morning and fix your eyes on the news, what happens? You sink like a stone into sadness. You focus your eyes on the word of God and the person of Jesus, you will be something else entirely. A diamond shines black, uh, brightest against black velvet. Christian, you get to shine the brightest in dark days, but only if they see the hope that's within you because in your heart, you've set apart, apart Christ as holy. Do you know him? Do you trust him? They need him.